you've heard me talk about Sylvia, the ghost who lives upstairs in my house. Sylvia got her start late one Halloween night when I was sitting in my living room alone, uh, nobody at the house but me, watching TV. And in the seat where I was sitting, I could see down the hallway, back into the back of our house, a long, a long dark hallway, uh, very dimly lit just by the living room lights. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone walk from the bathroom at the end of the hall across to the laundry room opposite it. Now I know I didn't see anybody. I know that it was, there was no one there to see. It was just kind of a trick of my eyes and of my mind who just kind of instantly processed that and startled me for a second. Uh, I thought, I can get some mileage out of this. And so I began to tell stories about Sylvia. I named her Sylvia. I made up a story about how Sylvia lived in the closet in the room upstairs. We had a lot of fun talking about Sylvia. Now you understand, I do not believe, I do not think there is a ghost in my house. I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to convince you that, there is, that I think there's a ghost. It's certainly not a ghost named Sylvia, if there was anything. It is a story. It is a fiction. It is something that is based on absolutely nothing except something that my mind told me I saw out of the corner of my eye. But it's still one of those stories that can kind of creep you out. You know, I get to telling that story to somebody and, and, and you can just see the goosebumps begin to rise up on their arms as they think about, oh, the possibility of that. And I enhance it a little and, and, and the hairs on the back of your neck kind of stand up. And, and it's fun to laugh about it. It's fun to do that because we, we enjoy being scared a little bit. We enjoy kind of getting that, that little rush that comes from that, that little fear because we know it isn't real. I noticed, though, that as time went on and I told that story more and more, even though we laughed, I started turning on more and more lights in a dark house, especially when I was alone. <laughs> Upstairs, I would be walking through the loft and get this creepy feeling that somebody was standing behind me and looking at me, and I would simply refuse to turn around, and I just marched straight to the stairs and down the stairs without looking. It got to the point where I was uneasy about going into the bedroom where that closet was, and it was almost as if there was a voice in my head telling me, you never know. What if it is true? What if there is somebody behind that door? What if, what if Sylvia does live upstairs? You see what's happening here? Beginning with this silly story based on absolutely nothing. A story really about nothing. Just a story to tell, to laugh about, and to have fun with. A story we told and developed, told, told just to feel a little bit of fright and then go on and enjoy that little moment of, of, of uneasiness that we get, you know, when we know something is not true, but still it just, it just feels kind of scary. Fear actually took hold. It worked on me and began to, to put flesh on this absolute fiction until the fear, fear started to control me. It controlled my mind and the way I thought about that. It controlled my emotions. It controlled my body. And I found that I actually had to go back and retrain my mind. I had to argue with myself, and when I began to feel one of these moments of panic that maybe someone is there, maybe there's someone behind me, maybe there's someone in the dark reaching out, I had to stop and say, that is just silly. Why are you thinking this way? You know it's not true. Ghosts are not real. There is nothing in the darkness or behind you that's going to jump on you. I had to literally force myself to go upstairs, open the closet door, and look inside. From this, from this simple little fun fright, fear, real fear, took over and took control and convinced me of something absolutely unreal and had me acting according to the fiction rather than according to the truth. Uh, Jesus begins a long section of teaching in Luke chapter 12 with these words. I tell you, my friends, 
do not be afraid. And he follows that theme of fear all the way through the end of the chapter. Because Jesus knows how controlling fear can be, how, how fear will worm its way into your heart through the tiniest of openings. He knows that fear will tell you these stories and get you focused on ideas and scenarios that are completely unfounded and unreal to the point, to the point that fear seems to take over and it begins to rule and you're living those fears. And reality doesn't matter much anymore because fear is, control, is in control. And instead of living by what we know, one part of our minds to be true, we start to live by another part of our minds where that fear has, has taken hold and begins to say, what if it is true? What if it is this way? So Jesus says, don't be afraid. He speaks about being afraid of those who can kill the body. And, and I have to say, that's not an irrational, unrealistic fear for these early Christians who, who faced the danger of death in confessing their faith, unlike us, who really have never really faced true danger in, in confessing our faith. These people were tortured and killed because they dared to say what they believed. Started with, with Stephen in, in Acts chapter 7. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And Acts 8 tells then of a, a great persecution that broke out against Christians led by Saul who began to destroy the church. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. And then in Acts, 13, or Acts 12, you have James the apostle killed by the order of Herod the king. And you can just work your way through history. One Christian after another, one group of Christians after another, discriminated against, mistreated, tortured, killed for their belief in the Lord Jesus. Jesus is not speaking to them about something far-fetched and unreal. He knows this is real. It will be their experience. Don't be afraid. Now, for, for us, the fear, I think, is no less controlling. When we face the wrath of people that we love and respect, who try to intimidate us out of living our faith, wives with angry husbands or husbands with angry wives, my own grandmother, my mother used to tell me, your grandmother, your grandfather loved your grandmother. Daddy loved mom more than anything you can possibly imagine, except for this one thing. He was just destroyed, angry, perplexed that she would actually go to church. And she said, I never saw them fight except about one thing. When mama got up in the morning and got dressed and went to church. And he tried to intimidate her in every way he possibly could. Children with disappointed parents, angry parents, perhaps our friends who might make jokes and make us feel like weirdos for actually going to church and trying to live for Jesus. You see, it isn't vicious like the persecution of Christians who die for their faith, but it's pretty effective nonetheless. It's pretty intimidating. We even conjure up fear when there's no reason. We are immersed in a culture where unbelief reigns, where where the story goes, truly educated people don't really believe in God. Where, where Christians are accused of being narrow-minded, of a blind adherence to traditions that have long ago been proved to be myths. To cling to them is, is, is at least foolish, and at worst, it is criminal. Christianity is the root of intolerance. It's the root of hatred. It's the root even of violence. See, that's the story we're told, and we don't believe that story. We, we do indeed trust Jesus, and we try to live by a different story. We try to live by a true story about infinite love and infinite sacrifice. Still, that's the story that we are fed all the time. This, this unbeliever story is the one that gets out in the, in the media and in our society. It's almost the air that we breathe, and it's almost like we feel it in our bones, that, that something is wrong with us if we actually believe in Jesus and say it. And fear starts to take hold. Fear of being different. And fear of somehow being unacceptable. Fear of looking foolish. Fear of looking dumb. Fear of being laughed at and made to feel to be an outsider, somehow, somehow out of step with smart people. That's the fear that Jesus begins with. He says, be on your guard against the yeast. 
Guys, you want to flip that over one? He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There's something appealing about the Pharisees, uh, something that Jesus characterizes as hypocrisy, yet even though they know it, it's still, real, still really appealing to them. Uh, they want to be like the Pharisees. They, they want to be accepted by the Pharisees. There is something appealing that, about the Pharisees that they, the disciples just don't want the Pharisees looking down on them. And somehow they think, if, if I can just get the respect of the Pharisees, if, if I can just have them okay with me, then everything will be good and right with me. And then fear starts to percolate in their thinking. What if? What if? And we come up with, you know, they come up with all of these what ifs. Uh, what, if, what if they don't like me? What if they make fun of me? What if they, what if they, have, what if they arrest me and they have the power? What if they have me killed? And soon, fear takes control. They are afraid of being killed. They are afraid to say publicly that they believe in Jesus. They may be holding on to the faith, but, but undercover, so nobody will know. You know, we, we kind of do it at home, do it in our closet, do it in quiet ways. We don't want anybody to notice. But when challenged, when it comes down to whether you say it or whether you deny it, you choose to deny it because of fear. Now, that's a bad kind of fear. That's, a, that's an intimidating sort of thing. But maybe even worse, maybe even more controlling, is the fear that develops out of anxieties about money. See, I don't think it's any accident that Jesus turns from talking about persecution and all of the fears that are associated with that to talking about money and all of the anxieties, all of the, all of the fears and worries that are associated with that. In the very moment when Jesus is talking about danger and persecution, someone in the crowd to him, uh, said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This, this anxiety about money, this, this greed, this, this fear of being without is so powerful that it crowds out even the most horrifying of fears. I wonder that Jesus didn't turn to him and say, did you hear what I was talking about? I'm talking about dying here for what you believe, and you're wanting to talk about inheritance money? But see, that's the thing that really grabs us and tends to control us, this anxiety about money, this, this greed, this fear of being without is so powerful. We know that fear, don't we? We who, who ought to have no fear at all, I mean, because we are wallowing in prosperity, most of us, if, if not all of us. And if, if we're in trouble about money at all, it's not because we don't have money. It's because we've wasted the, the great resources and wealth that we've, we've been entrusted with. But greed has taken over. And having, having this much, having so much, fear starts to work on us, fear of not having more. And Jesus begins to talk about in Luke 12, not terror, not, not the fear of being hurt or being killed, but he begins to talk about worry and anxiety, those, those nagging little fears that soon begin to control our attitudes as well as our actions, so that, so that pride in our work gives way to this desperate devotion of getting ahead or of saving for a rainy day or getting ready for retirement or hedging our bets or buying insurance to mitigate risk or a thousand one other things that start out so small and seemingly so smart and so insignificant but soon began to control us so that we are working amazingly cruel hours at cruel tasks and worrying that we've not yet done enough and not yet protected ourselves enough fearing that we'd never have enough and fearing that we need just a little more until fear takes over and it's every man for himself. We convince ourselves that the guys next door or the people who live in ghettos are somehow dangerous because they are taking our hard-earned money away from us. We fear that immigrants are going to swarm in and take away low-paying jobs that we don't even have in the first place. and That threatens us in our relatively high-paying jobs. We fear that Social Security is going to be cut or completely done away with, and on and on and on it goes until our fears take over and hatred and anger and selfishness begin to rule our heart. And the poor are no longer seen as brothers and sisters to be supported and, and helped as they try to get out of their poverty. Instead, they are seen as enemies who are trying to take away my security. Jesus calls for an end to fear. 
He says, verse 4, don't be afraid. In verse 7, he says, don't be afraid. In verse 32, he says, don't be afraid. In verse 11, he says, don't worry. Verse 22, don't worry. Verse 29, don't, uh, 26, don't worry. Verse 29, don't worry. But it isn't that Jesus is saying, look, guys, let me tell you, what we need to do, everybody, everybody just make an appointment. We all need a frontal lobotomy. We need to learn to just not care, relax, don't worry about it anymore, and not have any cares at all. That's not what Jesus says at all. What he says is, take your fears. Take those, take those nagging fears that start so small and then grow until they control you. Take those fears and shine the light of truth on them. First, Jesus says, you need to find out what real fear is. I tell you, my friends... Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus said if you're going to be afraid, if you're going to be controlled by fear, at least let it be an intelligent real fear. Let it be, let it be the fear of all fears. Instead of being ruled by these finite fears, these, these worries that we have, these anxieties, these, these things that make us uneasy, those things that even strike terror into our hearts, instead of being ruled by those things, learn to fear the infinite God of heaven and earth. Notice that he doesn't say, let me tell you what you should be afraid of. You should be afraid of going to hell. So we fret and we worry and we sweat. And we have nightmares about whether or not we're going to suffer in hell forever. And that fear starts to worm into our hearts. And, and it makes us bitter and doubtful and shriveled up in our souls, afraid and anxious. Jesus said, that's not the fear I'm talking about. Jesus says, fear him. The one who has the authority to throw you into hell. But understand, the focus here is not on hell. It's on the one who has all authority. And the one who has all power, who has more power than the Pharisees to harm you if he chose to. Who has the right to cast you into hell, that, that terrible, awful place of eternal misery and anger and hate and fear. He could throw you in there if he wanted to. But our experience of God is really not that experience of an angry, vicious God who is just trembling with anticipation at the opportunity to finally get even and cast you into hell. Our experience is of a God who watches over us very carefully and very lovingly, who forgives us, who accepts us, who works to bring good out of evil, who longs to bless us in every way. What Jesus is telling us is get straight about what really counts. Get straight about who truly rules. Get straight about what matters. And all of your other fears will fall into place or fall away completely. Instead of being ruled by fear, you'll be led by faith. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. I can just see the smile on Jesus' face as he says that. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, whoops, go back. When you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you'll say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you are than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you can't do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They, they don't labor or spend, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor 
was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And, and understand that to seek the kingdom is not to fret and worry about whether you've done enough or whether you have faith enough or whether you've gotten everything right. Jesus means trust in the reign of God. When he talks about seeking the kingdom, he is simply saying, put yourself under the rule of God. Put yourself under God's watchful eye. Live by his will and by his love. You can trust him. Because he is the perfect king who rules not for his own benefit or not for his own blessedness or not for what he can get out of it, but he rules for the benefit of his people who blesses and blesses and blesses and you will never be sorry for submitting to him. And so Jesus says, instead of being ruled by fear, you will be, number one, you will speak confidently. Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. No fear to tell who you are, what you believe, what you stand for, and why you believe it. Secondly, he says, you will think about yourself confidently. I don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. He says down in verse 31, all these things will be given to you as well. And thirdly, out of that confidence that comes from faith in God, we will be generous, we'll be free to care, we'll be free to love, we'll be free to enjoy. But Jesus said, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. In the book, The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis, uh, and that the Chronicles of Narnia are a, an allegory of the Christian life. Lewis tells about fear and he talks about Jill, who has come to Narnia, been misled by one of her friends. She is lost and dying of thirst, and she encounters Aslan, who represents Jesus. And she, she encounters this great lion for the first time. She doesn't yet know who Aslan is, nor what he stands for, or what he is, or what he's capable of. To her, he's just this big, huge, fierce lion. Aslan says to her, if you're thirsty, you may drink. They were the first words she had heard since Scrub had spoken to her on the edge of the cliff. For a second, she stared here and there, wondering who had spoken. Then the voice said again, if you're thirsty, you may drink. And of course, she remembered what Scrub had said about animals talking in that other world and realized that it was the lion speaking. Anyway, she had seen its lips move this time, and the voice was not like a man's. It was deeper wilder, stronger, a sort of heavy golden voice. It did not make her any less frightened than she had been before, but it made her frightened in rather a different way. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do, asked Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you, will you promise not to do anything to me if, if I come, said Jill? I make no promise, said the lion. 
Jill was so thirsty now, without noticing it, she'd come a step nearer. Do you eat girls? She asked. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you'll die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming a step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve a lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that. And her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she ever had to do. But she went forward to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Let's stand, and if you need to come to Jesus today, would you come while we're singing?